This is the second portion of the lecture on Chapter 9, Steroid Hormone Receptors. And we begin with uh, discussing steroid receptors and signal transduction pathways. Uh, the end of the previous lecture uh, discussed phosphorylation of the ligand-dependent steroid receptors as a mechanism for altering or modulating uh, the interaction with the uh, targeted DNA sequences, the consensus sequences, uh, regulatory elements. And now we consider uh, non-ligand related effects. Uh, the receptors have classically been viewed as the ligand activated or ligand dependent transcription factors. Now uh, we're seeing that there's modulation through kinase activity in cells uh, that can phosphorylate and activate some of the steroid receptor family members in the absence of the hormone. And uh, there are alternative means of activating some of these receptors uh, thereby. Since then, many examples of crosstalk between steroid receptor pathways and other signal transduction pathways have been described. Uh, so the complexity with which the steroid receptors can interact with DNA uh, is uh, much greater than what was originally anticipated. Uh, this is a figure uh, reflecting uh, some of that uh, interaction. So in this illustration, first we recognize the unligated hormone receptor uh, coupled with the heat shock proteins, and this upper portion is showing the typical ligand-dependent pathway uh, where the ligated receptor becomes uh, has a, develops a, a lower affinity for the heat shock protein, a higher affinity for another ligated uh, hormone receptor forms the homodimer and uh, then can bind to the uh, consensus sequence on the DNA promoter region of target genes. Uh, the alternate pathway being considered here, for example, the uh, typical type of uh, transmembrane spanning receptor uh, that is uh, metabotropic when ligated can activate uh, uh, protein kinases and uh, phosphatases and as well the uh, tyrosine kinase, the YP tyrosine kinase types of receptors typical of many growth hormones, growth factors, also can activate uh, the protein kinases and phosphatases uh, impacting the ligand <coughs> uh, d activated uh, route for uh, the effect on DNA but also having effects directly on the unligated form, making it capable of forming homodimers and binding to the DNA and having uh, certain effects, whether they're low affinity or high affinity, repressor, activator. Uh, we don't have uh, sufficient detail to comment right now, uh, but it is possible. So one of the pathways uh, n noted is uh, the ligand binding to a membrane receptor and activates a cyclic AMP pathway as uh, shown here. So a, a pathway that we're familiar with uh, already. So we won't comment any more on that uh, aspect of the steroid receptor function. Uh, we'll go back to consider the classical two-way stage mode of uh, hormone receptor action that of course uh, is uh, being modified as we gather new information on the molecular mechanisms for uh, activating these steroid hormone receptors. But the classical two stages, of course, the first stage is steroid hormones bind to their uh, cognate receptors in the cytoplasm of the cell or the nucleoplasm, depending upon where the uh, unligated hormone resides. Stage two, the ligate ligated receptor translocates to the nucleus and the ligated receptor attaches to non-histone proteins uh, of the chromatin. Uh, so we're working on uh, modifying that and we understand now that it's uh, much more complex than that and there are uh, several different exceptions. The uh, figure shown here is uh, uh, a crude, somewhat crude illustration of the molecular pathway of the steroid hormone action. So let's follow through these uh, labeled steps. 
First, of course, you find the steroid hormones uh, associated with plasma binding proteins in the plasma, and the uh, free hormone can diffuse out, of course, uh, or into the plasma, a dynamic movement there, and also into cells uh, freely through the plasma membrane, where in the cytoplasm, uh, the diffusion of the free hormone uh, can also reach the nucleus by passing through the nuclear membrane shown here in the yellow. Once in the nucleus, it can ligate the uh, receptors, uh, causing a conformational change and uh, freeing them from the heat shock proteins that we had mentioned. So there's a dissociation of the heat shock proteins. Then uh, the homodimer is formed and uh, the receptor zinc finger interaction with the DNA can occur on promoter regions uh, where that is encountered successfully by the uh, ligated uh, homodimeric receptor complex. Then transcription, of course, is affected, uh, affecting messenger RNA levels. Messenger RNA levels in the cytoplasm, of course, affecting translation. And then, of course, there is an altered cell function. So this is an uh, example where the uh, steroid hormone receptor resides in the unligated form complexed with heat shock proteins, uh, these chaperone proteins within the nucleus. And so we don't have the two-stage of cytoplasmic ligated then translocating to the nucleus as we saw in the previous slide. We have an exception to that uh, straight into the nucleus bringing about the effect. So both of these can occur. Uh, it's more of a uh, uh, dependency on where the uh, unligated hormone receptors uh, are located initially, uh, waiting to be ligated. The next uh, concept we can uh, discuss briefly is the measurement and regulation of hormone receptors. So they can be regulated. This first slide is going to comment on the specificity uh, of the, the binding and, um, excuse me, the dynamic nature of the binding uh, of the uh, steroid hormone to its receptor. So on the left-hand side, we see a panel uh, where, with time on the x-axis and tritiated uh, corticosterone uh, specific binding in femtomoles per milligram of protein on the y-axis. The way this study was performed is that the receptor is isolated from some tissue, in this case, uh, ambistoma uh, trig tigrinum. Uh, and uh, the isolated uh, hormone receptor is mixed, or even just the homogenate of the tissue is mixed with the tritiated corticosterone. Time is allowed to uh, pass and uh, samples are taken at each time point where you can uh, go through a process of separating the, uh, the hormones receptors, uh, some of which, depending upon time, of course, uh, will be ligated by the tritiated corticosterone, and then you wash away the, uh, the non-ligated corticost tritiated corticosterone and then uh, you on the receptor fraction you count the radioactivity and uh, knowing the specific activity of the tritiated corticosterone you add you can get uh, a concentration in femtomoles per milligram of protein obviously a protein assay would have to be run to get the protein concentrations of your homogenates and what we see is that over time uh, there is a gradual increase in ligation, and then ultimately uh, it plateaus. So the uh, total number of receptors that are present uh, that can bind virtually have bound, and you can reach a point where no more can be uh, bound. So this is logical. If enough of the ligand is present, ultimately all the receptors will, that can be ligated will be ligated. On the right-hand side, what we show is the uh, competition uh, where we would uh, uh, pre-incubate to achieve this level of ligation uh, and then add cold or unlabeled corticosterone and allow time to pass. And so there's a dynamic exchange between the ligated, tritiated, and the unligated. And uh, at any one point in time after having complete ligation, you see here the 100%, uh, 
this is a percent scale, percent uh, specific binding, or percent of the time uh, for the specific binding. So you start at 100% where they're all bound, similar to what we see here. And uh, eventually, the cold, unlabeled corticosterone will displace the labeled, and you can get a dynamic measurement of the uh, kinetics of the binding activity, both uh, going from unbound to bound and bound uh, to uh, dissociation uh, being competed off by the cold. So these are uh, typical measurements to examine the uh, dynamics, uh, the kinetics of the binding characteristics of receptors and their ligands. So there can be d different degrees of binding, or excuse me, ligation of the uh, receptors within a, a biological system. And the receptors uh, and their associated response mechanisms uh, can be regulated. So next we talk about regulation of the receptors. And first we consider uh, down regulation. So when the circulating hormone levels are high, the number of receptors will decrease. Uh, this is uh, a cell-dependent mechanism. The different, uh, and this will differentiate, excuse me, we will want to differentiate uh, from desensitization and downregulation uh, for the membrane receptors specifically, uh, but over time it can happen too uh, as well with the uh, uh, horm hormone receptors, the steroid hormone receptors. The downregulation typically will be mediated by reduced transcription and synthesis of the new receptors. So we think of desensitization as the receptor still being present. So if you ground it all up and uh, had the, every th all the subcellular organelles disrupted, you might find the same amount of binding capabilities, but um, in the functional uh, system, you could not produce a response. So it is desensitized, uh, not responding to the high levels of hormone. Uh, it's trying to get back to a homeostatic baseline response. And if that uh, continues, then there will be down regulation, which will um, reduce the number of receptors total uh, available for the cell. And we'll continue to consider this uh, phenomenon as we proceed. Now the opposite can be an upregulation uh, or even sensitization that we're not going to deal with here, but the upregulation uh, would occur when the hormone levels are low, uh, the number of receptor molecules is increased. This will typically depend on synthesis of new uh, hormone receptors. So if the hormone uh, is removed completely, then a downregulation uh, can occur uh, in some cases. What this means is that there's some baseline level of hormone necessary to keep transcription uh, levels of the hormone itself at baseline. So we would conclude from this then that the promoter region on the gene for the particular uh, hormone receptor we're considering uh, has a regulatory element uh, for that gene protein itself. So uh, the receptor itself must bind to the promoter region uh, of its own gene to some degree to keep just baseline levels of transcription uh, ongoing. So complete removal of some of the hormones will cause a uh, dramatic downregulation, and then you have a system that you think might be upregulated, uh, but it isn't, and it becomes unresponsive. Let's then consider some of the characteristics of the steroid receptors. Uh, we saw uh, the two panels uh, revealing something about the affinity, uh, relative amount of binding for only one form of the ligand, uh, resist displacement by other related molecules. So we saw that when the same molecule is used, one tritiated and one not tritiated, uh, then it was rather equivalent displacement uh, by the same type of molecule, but we'll see that if it's a slightly different type of molecule, uh, the affinity will be different, highest for the cognate ligand and differing for other related uh, molecules. The specificity is the likelihood that only one molecule will bind to the receptor ligand binding site, and of course this depends upon the affinity of the receptor. So specificity and affinity have an interplay. 
This can be seen in the binding affinities of steroids uh, to plasma proteins, as seen on this table. So not just to the receptors, but to the uh, proteins within the plasma that keep the uh, the steroid hormones uh, occupied, if you will, bound and unbound in a dynamic form, as we now understand, uh, <clears throat> so that the concentration in the plasma is higher than the interstitial fluid, and then the blood is an effective delivery route. So if we consider the cortisol-binding protein, we see that for cortisol, it has the highest uh, affinity and probably the highest specificity. Another adrenal corticosteroid, cortisone, has a, a tenfold less uh, affinity for the cortisol binding protein, estradiol, uh, pregnenolone, uh, very low, progesterone, um, relatively high, higher than cortisone, and 17 alpha hydroxy progesterone, rather high as well, uh, whereas testosterone is uh, much lower. Then when we consider the sex hormone binding globulin uh, in the blood, cortisol is low, cortisone is low, estradiol is quite high, uh, pregnenolone is uh, a decent range, progesterone is on the lower end, and 17-alpha-hydroxy alpha progesterone uh, is similar to progesterone, and then testosterone is uh, extremely high as well. So there seems to be a high affinity of the sex hormone binding globulin for the sex hormones, the gonadal steroids, estradiol, and progesterone rather selectively, and we would suspect, therefore, that they'd have a high specificity for testosterone uh, and uh, estradiol. When we look at albumin, uh, the co most common uh, protein, general protein in the plasma, uh, we see that it has a low affinity for nearly all of these, although it does contribute to the transport uh, properties of the plasma for these steroid hormones. Now let's go back to think about the, res the cellular receptor uh, relative to uh, specificity uh, as we had noted. So this is from the same study that we saw before, the tritiated corticosterone from the uh, Ambistoma uh, tigranum. Uh, it's a membrane fraction, uh, resuspended, uh, and then uh, incubated with the 2.5 nanomolar tritiated corticosterone uh, and then of course what they're going to do is mix it with different uh, related molecules to see uh, which is most effective at dissociating the tritiated corticosterone from the receptor. So we take a look at our, our graph and we see the log of the steroid concentration in molar on the x-axis and on the y-axis the tritiated uh, corticosterone specific binding the percent of control so at first uh, it's 100 uh, percent because uh, we pre-incubated uh, the membrane fractions with the uh, tritiated corticosterone and then we try to compete off the binding with various molecules cortisone corticosterone as we had seen before so this is basically the same curve from the previous figure uh, aldosterone, dexamethasone, which is uh, uh, a synthetic uh, glucocorticoid that does have similar effects to, gluco to corticosterone, RU486, that is uh, a progesterone receptor antagonist, uh, but also uh, is effective at the, uh, the glucocorticoid receptor, progesterone, and then uh, 15 uh, uh, deoxy uh, corticosterone. So it's quite obvious uh, that the affinity uh, and specificity is highest for the corticosterone itself uh, and none of the others uh, really even come close to competing off, you know, hardly bring it down below 80 percent, to competing off the uh, tritiated corticosterone. So this produces a, a value of a Ki, the concentration at which uh, you get 50 percent inhibition of the binding of the corticosterone and that was at uh, 0 0.37 uh, nanomolar. So this is 10 to the minus 9 that would be nanomolar. So somewhere in here we come up and we see that we are at uh, 50 percent. Now we can go back to the other figure and calculate another uh, K value uh, it would be the 
uh, well, this isn't concentration. If you're doing concentrations, it'd be the concentration at which you get 50% binding. This graph is not appropriate uh, to calculate the uh, uh, the the KD. But we'll we'll talk about that more later when we have appropriate data. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so now let's uh, consider what happens. <coughs> excuse me to uh, these uh, chemical messengers, the the steroid hormones, uh, after they have produced their biological effect. Uh, we know we have the life cycle of the molecule: synthesis, secretion, activation through its receptor, and uh, degradation and removal. So. The gonadal steroid hormones, uh, as a model for the steroid hormones, undergo catabolism or additional metabolism to biologically inactive forms, much lower affinity and specificity for the receptors, and uh, of course are more likely to be excreted uh, by the kidney. So here we see progesterone can be converted to uh, 20-dihydroprogesterone, and then finally to uh, pregnanodiol, Testosterone uh, through reductase can be converted to dihydrotestosterone. Uh, through other uh, enzymatic systems can be converted to androsterone. And finally to andros, uh, diol. Uh, these would be the molecules, uh, the catabolites, metabolites detected in the urine. For estradiol can be converted to estriol, estrone sulfate. Uh, notice the, the three, uh, so this is diol, two hydroxy groups, I OL meaning alcohol, uh, three, one added or one removed uh, with a sulfate added, uh, equiline or the catechol estrogens uh, that we've talked about before. So uh, <clears throat> these molecules will have the highest affinity and specificity for their cognate receptors, uh, excuse me, uh, well, we'll talk about testosterone in a little more detail, but uh, uh, <coughs> it, it, of these, it would have the, the highest. So let's uh, continue to uh, consider this uh, degradation, this catabolism, the testosterone uh, being acted on by 5-alpha reductase. Uh, can uh, produce 5-alpha uh, dihydrotestosterone. And... Uh, additional enzymatic uh, alterations can produce 5-alpha androstane, 3-beta, 17-beta diol, uh, and 5-alpha uh, androstane, 3-alpha, uh, 17-beta uh, diol. So the difference here is the 3-beta and 3-alpha. Uh, <clears throat> we're now beginning to wonder what are these uh, numbers uh, on here. And uh, just quickly, I'll go to the next slide to show the uh, pregnenolone, uh, which is one of the intermediaries on the way to synthesis of testosterone. And we see that there are four rings uh, in this. It originates from cholesterol, A, B, C, D. And the carbon molecules are numbered. Uh, this top center uh, carbon in, in ring A is carbon 1, 2, three, four, five. So this is the five carbon that we would want to uh, follow in the five alpha reductase. So there's the carbon five. Uh, there is a reduction at this point. So we lose that double bond and get five alpha uh, DHT. And then uh, the five alpha uh, androstane three beta 17 diol converts it to uh, two um, uh, uh, OH groups, so we therefore now have the diol. And the beta and the alpha uh, are uh, terminologies that uh, I can't do much to help you with. Let's see. Uh, so the one, two, three. Sorry, I keep pushing the wrong buttons. <laughs> so the three beta it'd be one, two, three. So it must be the orientation of the hydroxyl group in either a beta position and an alpha position. And then the 17 uh, diol, uh, carbon 17 is up here. And we see that uh, up there. 
The other uh, metabolic pathway for testosterone, of course, uh, is to uh, ar- have uh, an enzyme called aromatase act on it, uh, and that can convert testosterone to estradiol. And we'll see this indeed is the biosynthetic pathway to produce estradiol in the females. So uh, aromatase is going to act on the uh, A ring here. Uh, and uh, aromatize it by breaking the double bond on the carbonyl group here, converting it to a hydroxyl group, the OH group, and then you get this uh, aromatic uh, ring, phenolic ring, uh, for the A ring. And then now have two hydroxyl groups, two OH groups, so it is uh, the diol, so it is 17 uh, beta estradiol. This was the 17 carbon here. So there's the 17 carbon, and so it's 17 beta estradiol is the most common uh, form uh, of the uh, estrogens uh, in uh, humans, and it is, when we talk about estrogen, it is the 17 beta estradiol uh, that we are considering. These can be further, this can be further metabolized, as we saw, to the catechol estrogens, the two uh, hydroxy estradiol shown here, so one, two uh, hydroxy estradiol, or the four hydroxy estradiol, one, two, three, four, uh, get the hydroxyl group uh, added there. These are two of the catechol estrogens uh, that could be detected as catabolites uh, within the urine. Now these catabolites uh, that can be, or metabolites uh, that can be detected in the urine are very important uh, in testing, uh, for example, for exogenous uh, hormones. If uh, uh, synthetic hormones are are taken uh, that uh, reduce endogenous testosterone and or estrogen, then these levels in the urine would uh, be uh, below normal levels, and it would indicate exogenous uh, steroidal hormones had been added to the system because we would presume that the exogenous hormones would be of a different nature and would not be catabolized to to these forms. Uh, Next, let's consider the aromatization of testosterone to estrogen in the context of getting to activity at the estrogen receptor or the androgen receptor. So in the, the sense of specificity and affinity, we have an androgen receptor for the androgens, and an estrogen receptor for the estrogens, and the 17-beta estradiol, 17-beta estradiol, uh, has the highest affinity and specificity for the estrogen receptor, and of course that's uh, ultimately the pregnenolone alone uh, is converted to testosterone, and then the aromatase uh, forms the 17-beta estradiol that has the highest affinity and specificity for the estrogen receptor. What we're going to do is consider some cases uh, at the level of the anterior pituitary as to whether aromatase uh, is present uh, to uh, have to mediate uh, estradiol negative feedback effects through the estrogen receptor on anterior pituitary cells. 5-alpha reductase uh, will convert the the five carbon here uh, will reduce it to form 5-alpha dihydrotestosterone, uh, and uh, this is the androgen that has the highest specificity and affinity for the androgen receptor. So male gonadal steroid-mediated effects or uh, anabolic uh, androgenic steroids uh, act through the androgen receptor uh, and typically are resistance resistant to uh, aromatase activity so that you do not get estrogen receptor mediated effects. Uh, Bodybuilders certainly wouldn't want to uh, activate their estrogen receptors and develop uh, female characteristics. They obviously want the androgenic anabolic steroid effect. Uh, And there are many obviously legitimate uh, clinical uses for androgenic anabolic steroids in muscle wasting, a variety of uh, diseases like that where you want the uh, anabolic effect of these uh, androgen uh, steroids. So we don't want to just focus on the uh, socially unacceptable use and uh, medically risky use 
an illegal use of the anabolic androgenic steroids. There are uh, legitimate clinical uses uh, for these uh, substances. So the genomic effects are what we are considering of these uh, <coughs> anabolic excuse me, these uh, um, steroidal hormones, and uh, we're still th focusing on effects on neurons in the central nervous system. And this is a figure from our text, figure 916, that is showing the regulation of receptor synthesis by steroid hormones and the effects of estradiol benzoate on the uh, number of mescarinic receptors, femtomoles per milligram of protein, shown here on the y-axis, in nerve cells in three regions of the hypothalamus. There are overectomized uh, female rats were treated for two days with uh, either sesame oil or 10 micrograms of estradiol benzoate and sesame oil. Uh, the estradiol elevated the number of muscarinic receptors in the anterior hypothalamus and the ventromedial nucleus of the hypothalamus, but not in the arcuate nucleus. So we've seen that shown, we see that shown graphically here, the number of muscarinic receptors. Uh, in the anterior hypothalamus, ventromedial hypothalamus, and the arcuate nucleus. Obviously, the differences between the means and the uh, oil control, the vehicle control, versus the estradiol treated rats uh, is uh, signific significantly uh, different from each other. We see that the error bars, uh, even though they are quite extensive, we see it's uh, almost 100 percent, excuse me, 100 femtomoles per milligram of protein. But if you take this error bar and project it down, it does not overlap with this one. The same is the case for the ventromedial hypothalamus. The uh, magnitude of the effect, the differences between the means, is uh, quite large. It's uh, uh, recognizable, certainly. And even if we extend this down, this error bar down, it would not overlap. So these uh, would be significantly different. You see that the uh, magnitude of difference between these two bars and the distance between the error bars uh, is uh, recognizable. And therefore, you have two asterisks showing that it is a significance uh, at the level of P uh, less than 0 0.02, which is pretty uncommon. But anyway, usually you use P less than 0.5 or P less than 0.1, P less than 0.01, P less than 2 is <laughs> quite uncommon. But anyway, uh, that's obviously more significant uh, than this one here because the difference between the two, the magnitude of the effect, is not quite so uh, um, robust. And the error bars, therefore, get a little bit closer together. So you have a P less than 0 0.05. Obviously, uh, the magnitude of the effect the differences between the means here is uh, not very robust, and definitely their error bars uh, overlap. So this is obviously not statistically significant uh, difference uh, between the oil vehicle and the estradiol uh, on the number of muscarinic receptors in the arcuate nucleus. So we can see that there are significant effects of the uh, steroid hormones on protein expression, the gene expression that ultimately leads to protein expression uh, in neurons uh, throughout the brain. One of the examples is uh, impacts on receptors. Change the number of receptors, you change the biological responsiveness of the organism uh, to the tr cognate neurotransmitters. Uh, here uh, <clears throat> in this slide, we are uh, Following through with the discussion of the uh, metabolism of testosterone to uh, estrogen uh, in the male, where we see the biosynthetic pathway in the Leydig cells and in the Sertoli cells. The Sertoli cells uh, are uh, in the uh, seminiferous tubules and help to support spermiogenesis. And we see that this is dependent upon the estrogen receptor. Uh, so the testosterone that is synthesized from the cholesterol ester uh, will focus on all these synthetic mechanisms later when we talk about the HPG axis. But obviously, as we've discussed previously, the transmembrane signal transduction mechanism for the water-soluble gonadotropins uh, will act on biosynthetic enzyme activity uh, 
uh, recruiting precursor from its uh, esterified stored form to be fed through the uh, intermediary steps to the uh, end product that is synthesized uh, <clears throat> at the highest concentrations and therefore diffuses away in, not only into the plasma but also into the seminiferous tubules where aromatase gene is expressed in the Sertoli cells and its enzyme activity is regulate, regulated again by the cyclic AMP dependent mechanism uh, driven by uh, follicle stimulating hormone uh, to uh, convert the testosterone to estrogen and then estrogen will bind to the estrogen receptor in the Sertoli cells to contribute to the sustenance of the uh, spermiogenesis. So other than just uh, reflecting a bit on the significance of the aromatization of testosterone uh, for function in the male, uh, we ask the question that uh, in females where estrogen is produced from the gonads, because aromatase is always present, and estradiol contributes to the negative feedback at the level of the anterior pituitary, uh, does testosterone in the male contribute to negative feedback at the anterior pituitary or is it mediated through estrogen uh, receptors? So is there a gender difference in the anterior pituitary uh, for the receptors, the gonadosteroid receptors that are present to contribute to genomic effects in the anterior pituitary? And this would be true in other places. So this is table 9-2 from the textbook focusing on the location of androgen, androgen target cells in the body. Uh, in some target cells, the testosterone binds directly to androgen receptors. In other target cells, the testosterone is reduced to the 5-alpha uh, dihydrotestosterone, the 5-alpha DHT, which then binds to the androgen receptor, or the testosterone might be aromatized to estrogen, which then binds to the estrogen receptors. And what we see that is uh, the organ that is not listed on this uh, system is the anterior pituitary, and that's one of the questions that we're posing uh, relevant to negative feedback of the gonadal steroids on the anterior pituitary. I know we're focusing on the gonadal steroids, uh, but this is just as an example of a system that's a bit more complex than uh, the glucocorticoids, uh, the other prime example of the uh, steroid hormones. So testosterone acting on the androgen receptors occurs in the CNS, spinal cord, nuclei, testes, seminiferous tubules, epididymis, penis, muscle, kidney, adipose tissue, and the immune system. And of course, the, uh, the muscle tissue is the target of the anabolic androgenic uh, steroids. Uh, in the 5-alpha DHT acting on the androgen receptors, uh, the central nervous system, and of course, this effect is related to the uh, uh, quite well-documented increase in aggression, uh, behavior alterations in individuals that consume exogenous uh, anabolic uh, androgenic steroids. <clears throat> the 5-alpha reductase is considered in, excuse me, the 5-alpha DHT is uh, involved in the feedback on GnRH. And then here we have to ask ourselves, well, what happens in the female? And so is there truly a gender difference in the gene expression, the cellular gene expression of the gonadal steroid receptors um, in males versus females? Uh, spinal cord nuclei, prostate, epididymis, penis, sebaceous glands, uh, and the bone. So here we see muscle and bone obviously being targets of the uh, anabolic androgenic steroids. The estrogen receptors also in the CNS, also in the testes, the seminal vesicles, uh, and the uh, adipose tissue. And this uh, list is uh, much longer now as there's been more work done on the uh, uh, multiple forms of the estrogen receptor and we'll uh, view a little bit of that in a moment. But let's continue with this question about uh, the uh, localization of aromatase in different species and in the anterior pituitary uh, on the uh, matter of uh, the gender differences. So we're still asking that question. So this is figure uh, nine seven from the textbook looking at phyletic, phyletic differences in the neuroanatomical distribution of the aromatase enzyme that converts the estrogen, uh, testosterone to estrogen. And we see the brain of a teleost fish with very high levels, medium levels, and low levels, and then zero. So the 
the fish and the bird uh, and the reptile have uh, ever, uh, uh, I guess we'd go fish, reptile, bird, have ever decreasing levels to the point of mammals with a very low level. So the question is asked uh, if uh, in <coughs> uh, uh, mammals, uh, what is the fate of estrogen in the brain? And uh, is testosterone uh, involved in generating estrogen-mediated effects uh, in uh, males? So these are uh, interesting questions, uh, and uh, there's much more detail that comes out on studies of mammals. And we'll look at a few examples, such as uh, this, focusing really on the pituitary. Let's think about negative feedback at the anterior pituitary. So uh, this is an early paper, 1985, from the uh, General Comparative Endocrinology uh, Journal. And uh, uh, the detection of aromatase and a few other uh, enzymes <coughs> excuse me, uh, were detected in isolated and cultured gonadotropic cells from uh, the catfish. So remember the aromatase levels were high uh, in the fish. So these uh, gonadotropic cells were isolated uh, from the uh, uh, fish pituitary gland and uh, were shown to be able to convert androstenedione into estrone. <clears throat> these are slightly variant forms, uh, as you recognize, of the uh, androgens and the estrogens, uh, but that's fine. Uh, there are species differences, as we uh, understand. So the estrone could be metabolized uh, by a catechol estrone into 2 methoxyestrone. From these results, it can be concluded that the gonadotropes of mature catfish contain the enzymes aromatase, estrogen 2 hydroxylase, and catechol ol methyltransferase. <clears throat> the possible function of these enzymes in steroid negative feedback regulation of uh, gonadotropin hormone releasing uh, release uh, is discussed uh, in this paper. So what you're beginning to see now is that I want to uh, <clears throat> work on the development of understanding uh, novel contributions uh, to the uh, the uh, area under study. Uh, really just from reading abstracts. So we can almost construct components of a textbook uh, from abstracts. This isn't the most valid, valid approach, but it's a, one, a, a skill that we need to develop to gain that appreciation. And of course, much of the final part of this course depends upon uh, a variety of abstracts. You're more than welcome to go and read all the multiple papers that are included. Uh, but I want us to see and value the information that we can get just from reading abstracts. So at least in the fish, the aromatase is present uh, in the anterior pituitary. And <clears throat> I'll read through this. I know you can't uh, quite read it, but uh, I'll take you through this and a few other uh, articles in just a moment. So this also is an early article in 1983 from the Journal of Endocrinology. Identification of aromatase activity in rodent pituitary cell uh, strains. So this is a mammal, obviously. So aromatase uh, was being uh, detected early on. And what we also notice is that uh, the first study depended upon uh, enzyme activity analyses. <coughs> uh, and let's see what uh, uh, this one uh, relied on. I see a tritiated uh, um, uh, androgen, so very likely also uh, enzyme assays. Uh, so this was before other methods of visualizing the proteins uh, and looking at gene expression were um, extremely uh, uh, successful and widely used. So uh, at that time, the biochemical evidence uh, uh, for hypophyseal aromatization is uh, was only in the one species, the, the fish, the teleost fish, uh, although the pituitary glands of several uh, mammals uh, had been uh, reported to be aromatase negative, uh, as we saw in the figure from our text. So this group decided to reinvestigate the problem, uh, and they established clonal, clonal strains of rodent pituitary cells, GH3, GH4C1, uh, and ATT20D16. Uh, 
and uh, they were incubated at 37 degrees, obviously, 6 to 48 hours in serum-free, using serum less, but serum-free medium uh, containing uh, tritiated androstenedione, so a precursor or intermediate uh, to produce the testosterone and then to measure if the uh, estrogen was produced. So radio-labeled metabolites were isolated by solute extraction, thin layer chromatography, phenolic partition, the authenticity of the estrogenic products in the uh, both cells and incubation medium was verified by methylation, recrystallization uh, to constant specific activity. Quite a bit of work here. Measurement of antigen metabolites was also validated uh, by recrystallization. Uh, authentic estrone and 17 beta estradiol were identified in cultures of two prolactin and growth hormone uh, secreting clones and there were strain differences in the quantity of estrogen produced uh, the G3 greater than the uh, GH4 uh, C1. So what we're seeing is that uh, the estrogen receptor might be important in lactotropes and somatotropes. Under the same conditions, uh, aromatization uh, was not detectable in uh, corticotrope-like uh, cell line, uh, the AT20, T20, D16. Uh, a second, under uh, this, uh, excuse me, a, a time yield uh, analysis uh, of androgen metabolism in the GH4C1 cells. Uh, showed that aromatization was linear for 12 hours after labeling, so very stable uh, enzymatic activity, but that substrate was diverted mainly uh, to 5-alpha reducing pathways. So uh, this was uh, testosterone going to 5-alpha DHT, not necessarily just to estrogen, Large suggesting as well the antigen receptor being important. Large amounts of high polar metabolites uh, accumulated 24 to 48 hours uh, after addition of tritiated androgen and subsequent uh, hydrolysis revealed that these uh, were sulfo and glucouronal uh, conjugates. So the me metabolic fate of estrogen in the GH4C1 cultures was investigated indirectly by adding a radio inert estrone trap together with the radio labeled androgen substrate and was also tested in separate cultures by adding tritiated estrone and tritiated estradiol uh, directly. So although the two estrogens were interconverted, there was no evidence uh, that formed or added estrogen was extensively metabolized or con conjugated. So they concluded that the expression of aromatase activity in hypophysial cells is not a property of all transformed lines, but it may be dictated by the secretory cell type uh, although low relative to other metabolites, estrogen yields in cultured GH cells resemble production in primary cultures derived from other tissues known to be estrogen targets, including the hypothalamus. So we can see that enzyme uh, uh, properties are present. Now we shoot to 2002, a paper from pituitary, and we see the expression of aromatase P450 increased uh, in spontaneous prolactinomas of aged rats. So we saw the uh, lactotropes uh, as uh, being identified in that early 1980s paper. Uh, <clears throat> and this group has uh, recently reported the presence of aromatase P450 uh, in the rat hypothesis. So it's responsible for aromatizing testosterone to estradiol. And uh, in this article, they related it to uh, induction of uh, prolactinomas. And I won't take you uh, through this one uh, word for word. I'll let you take a, a look at it. And what we're seeing is that, obviously, there's a great deal of interest in this, not only in the anterior pituitary, but in tissues in general, because of uh, estrogen-dependent uh, tumors, especially uh, breast tumors. So if you do a search on estrogen uh, receptor and aromatase, uh, you'll find a lot of literature on aromatase uh, uh, inhibition, inhibitors, and the potential uh, use in therapy. Let's uh, then take a look at this paper from Cell and Tissue Research in 1999, uh, Immunohistochemical Evidence of the president, Presence of Aromatase P450 in the Rat Hypothesis. So this is the, the same uh, group as you'll see. 
the uh, uh, Caratero, the first author, and a few of the others are on both of these articles. So this is uh, their first report on the immunohistochemical uh, detection of the protein, the enzyme protein itself in the anterior pituitary. So now we're progressing from enzyme assays to demonstrations that the protein itself uh, is present. We don't know if this protein uh, that is identified by antibodies, immunohistochemical, uh, is enzymatically active, but we would presume it to be so uh, from the prior studies. So uh, they performed an immunohistochemical study of young adult males uh, and female rats. They revealed that the hypothesis of adult rats contain aromatase immunoreactivity although marked differences are found between the sexes, so there is a gender difference uh, in the aromatase levels. The hypotheses of the male rats have cells immunoreactive for the enzyme. 34.4% uh, of these hypothesial cells uh, showing the reaction. By contrast, the females have very little reaction, 0.84% of them being uh, reactive. So it's this t is telling us is that in female rats, uh, the aromatase is present in other tissues, such as the ovaries and the adrenal gland, uh, to produce all the estrogen necessary to target estrogen receptors if they are uh, present uh, in the anterior pituitary. <clears throat> and we would presume that they would be, at least uh, for the negative feedback on the gonadotropes, gonadotropins in the gonadotropes. So in the, in the male anterior pituitary, we're beginning to suspect that um, the estrogen receptors might also be involved in negative feedback of testosterone via uh, conversion with aromatase to t estrogen uh, acting at the uh, estrogen receptors in the gonadotropes. So there's no significant differences in the percentages of immunoreactive cells between one phase uh, and another or observed during the estrous cycle. So this doesn't change throughout the estrous cycle. So the results point to the immunohistochemical expression of aromatase in the hypothesis of adult rats and at the same time suggest that expression is sex dependent. The enzyme may uh, therefore be involved in the regulation of adenohypophyseal uh, cytology uh, by androgens. So what we might uh, predict then is that the, uh, the promoter region of the estrogen receptor, excuse me, of aromatase uh, might have uh, the uh, androgen response element on it so that testosterone would drive its expression. That's one hypothesis that could be tested. Here are two figures uh, from that uh, research article. The figure two is uh, from uh, the uh, female rat in the diesterous phase. So there's hardly any of the brown stain. You see the blue stain is a counter stain to see the nuclei uh, of the anterior pituitary cells. Notice the pseudo acinar arrangement around the capillaries. Uh, and in the male, of course, this brown label uh, showing up uh, at a, a high concentration and uh, in a large number of anterior pituitary cells. Uh, the same group uh, performed uh, their most recent work was a postnatal differentiation of this immunohistochemical expression. Uh, in the rat pituitary gland. I won't take you through this uh, other than to uh, emphasize the point of cell specific, tissue specific, um, gene expression, gender differences, and developmental differences. So we need to keep all of these in mind uh, in our efforts to appreciate the diversity and the complexity of biological uh, hormonal signaling systems. And then finally, uh, we'll take a look at this uh, paper from 1994 in the Journal of Andrology, the direct pituitary effect of testosterone to inhibit gonadotropin secretion in men, so this is humans, is partially mediated by aromatization to estradiol. So let's ask if the direct pituitary effect uh, shown in this study is giving us an indication that aromatase uh, exists within gonadotrope cells uh, in uh, human males. So in men, administration of exogenous testosterone exerts direct negative feedback effects at the pituitary as well as at the hypothalamic level. So this is uh, no surprise to us. 
The study was undertaken to determine the, uh, whether uh, testosterone itself causes uh, the inhibitory effects on the pituitary or whether conversion to estradiol or dihydrotestosterone is required. So they assessed the biological activity of serum LH and FSH as well as uh, immunoreactivity, uh, immunoactivity, excuse me. Uh, blood samples were drawn during, before, during, and after a continuous 72-hour IV infusion of testosterone, 15 milligrams per, per, day, per day, estrogen, or DHT. Each of these doses is twice the daily production rate of the steroid. Each man received uh, each of the three steroid infusions. Uh, we studied four men ages 23 to 35 with idiopathic uh, hypothalamic uh, hypogonadism. Uh, who were treated with the pulsatile gonadotropin releasing hormone until their gonadotropins reached the normal uh, levels. Serum levels of testosterone, estradiol, and uh, DHT, uh, and levels uh, of immunologically active and biologically active LH and FSH were measured. So uh, not only uh, immunodetectability, but biological uh, activity. So I like that uh, aspect of this. Uh, remember, with the degradation, uh, we might have alteration of these, but they might still, so they're no longer biologically active, but they might still stick to an antibody. So uh, I like showing uh, both of these levels, a uh, nice feature of this study. So we found that administration of each steroid increased serum levels of the infused steroid to the upper physiological range. The administration of testosterone and estradiol resulted in decreased mean levels of biologically and immunologically active LH and FSH. Administration of DHT did not alter gonadotropin uh, secretion. These data suggest that some of the direct effects of testosterone at the pituitary level in men is mediated by estradiol, whereas peripherally uh, formed DHT may not play an important role in this process. So what we don't know from this study is uh, whether the uh, testosterone that was infused is uh, being converted to estradiol um, by aromatase in the pituitary or in peripheral tissues, and uh, then the estradiol plasma levels increased uh, as a result of that, <clears throat> and uh, thereby uh, bound to the estrogen receptor in the anterior pituitary and produced the negative feedback on the gonadotropins in the gonadotropes. Um, I'm just checking to see, we'd have to look at the actual data, I guess, in the research article as to whether uh, they measured, what was the measurement of the estradiol levels in the plasma when uh, testosterone uh, was administered. So did the testosterone in the plasma, uh, did the estradiol levels in the plasma uh, from conversion of testosterone to estradiol increase significantly such that we would th consider it a systemic effect. If it didn't, uh, if the estradiol levels didn't increase significantly in the testosterone infused uh, subjects, then we would suspect localized conversion in the anterior pituitary to produce a locally significant uh, level of estradiol in the gonadotropes uh, to bind to the estrogen receptor. So we see that the, uh, from the evidence that we've looked at, uh, we don't have a complete picture yet. It may be there in the rest of the literature, but from what we've looked at so far, we don't have a complete picture as to whether uh, negative feedback of the uh, gonadal steroids in the ma human male uh, are mediated through estradiol because uh, aromatase is present within the gonadotropins in the anterior pituitary uh, to convert the testosterone to estradiol and bind to its uh, receptor. Now, there might have been some studies and uh, isolated post-mortem uh, anterior pituitary cells <clears throat> with a variety of methods, looking at messenger RNA for gene expression of the estrogen receptor and aromatase, uh, immunohistochemical or other immunochemical uh, approaches uh, to look at protein and maybe bioassays to see if it's a functional receptor. Uh, so we'd have to dig through the literature to see if that has been demonstrated. Again, what we're doing is working on our ability to uh, go from the textbook to review articles 
to primary literature to put together uh, the picture that we want to um, have for our global understanding of the mechanisms of actions of uh, the steroid hormones and specifically within the regulation of the endocrine systems, uh, the roles in negative feedback. So uh, I did a search in PubMed uh, typing in androgen receptor uh, with these quotation marks, forces it to keep these two words together, and pituitary, and uh, you can see this is reference 12 and 13, a large number uh, came up, including the ones that we've looked at already. Uh, and here's a paper in 2004, the effects of hormones targeting nuclear receptors on transcriptional regulation of the growth hormone gene in MTTS rat somatotrope uh, cell lines. So uh, we see that the, uh, the focus of the study is not only on negative feedback in the anterior pituitary, but impacts on other uh, hormone systems. So obviously androgen receptor impacting growth hormone for the anabolic uh, androgenic effects uh, seems relevant. <clears throat> uh, dihydrotestosterone may inhibit hypothalamic pituitary adrenal activity by acting through estrogen receptors in the male mouse. So uh, the, the levels of complexity, and this is in 2004, uh, begin to increase uh, tremendously. So how might dihydrotestosterone, the 5-alpha DHT, mediate it effect, its effects through the estrogen receptor? Is this because the estrogen receptor has some affinity, biologically significant affinity and specificity for DHT? Or is the DHT somehow uh, taken back through the enzymatic pathway to testosterone and then aromatase acting on it to generate estrogen to bind to the estrogen receptor? So these are the skills that I hope you are beginning to develop to ask questions uh, and come up with uh, hypothetical answers to these questions just from looking at the titles because we are learning so much about these endocrine systems. Reference uh, 19 seen uh, here, small nuclear ring finger protein stimulates the rat luteinizing hormone beta promoter by interacting with SP1 and steroidogenic factor 1 and protects from androgen suppression. Well, this is an interesting one and I think I pulled this paper to take a look at it. This is 2004 from Molecular Endocrinology and here Oh, no, I, I didn't pull that one, but that one was very interesting. Let's go back to that title. So we have uh, nuclear ring finger protein. That's a new one to me. I'll have to go and uh, read on this to find out what that is. So uh, new uh, protein type, I guess, uh, classification uh, seems uh, to be targeting uh, the gene expression through promoter, so it is obviously some type of transcription factor. We saw the zinc finger, this is a ring finger, uh, and uh, SP1 and steroidogenic factor 1, <clears throat> and protects from androgen uh, suppression. So uh, this is uh, some type of a mechanism that can attenuate uh, androgen-mediated suppression of uh, gene expression uh, for the uh, luteinizing hormone uh, beta subunit. And we already talked about uh, uh, LH, FSH, and uh, TH being heterodimeric uh, uh, hormones, <clears throat> and um, they share the common alpha, but the beta is what is different. So the focusing on the beta uh, uh, subunit for each of these uh, and the gene is most significant when considering negative feedback on each of them. <clears throat> Here now we have an article from 2005 in Cell and Tissue Research, the induction of growth hormone, prolactin, and TSH beta, right? Uh, messenger RNA. So now we see we've progressed from enzyme assays to amino assays to uh, RNA assays to look at gene expression and functional assays to look at regulation of gene expression. So looking at just messenger RNA levels, uh, and, or induction <coughs> would be uh, uh, static measurements uh, with some uh, implication for function 
And then functional assays on uh, the promoter regions are different to see how things really are operating uh, within a functional biological system. So the data is valuable, but the interpretation is always limited, as we have said. So by transfection of the PIT1 in a human pituitary adenoma-derived cell line. So we already saw PIT1 showing up before. It is a, an organ or tissue-specific uh, uh, regulatory uh, transcription factor. <clears throat> so it is uh, contributes to uh, tissue cell-specific gene expression in the anterior pituitary. So the functional development of pituitary cells uh, depends on the expression of a combination of transcription factors and cofactors. Pituitary-specific transcription factor 1, PIT1, is required for the expression of growth hormone, uh, prolactin, and thyroid-stimulating hormone beta subunit, uh, TSH beta, and acts synergistically with the estrogen receptor and uh, GATA binding protein 2, uh, so these obviously seem like uh, transcription factors, uh, the GATA2, uh, and certainly the estrogen receptor is, as we know. This is the context of our discussion in general, focusing on uh, the estrogen, the gonadal, excuse me, the steroid receptor-mediated gene transcription regulation in the anterior pituitary, not just limited to within the cognate HP axis, if you will, uh, but uh, some of the complexities of the interactions between the different axes. <clears throat> so uh, this is uh, involved in the indu induction of prolactin and TSH uh, beta expression respectively. So the glycoprotein hormone, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, alpha subunit, alpha SU, is the first hormone uh, to be expressed during pituitary development, in addition to being expressed in follicle-stimulating hormone, uh, luteinizing hormone in TSH cells, alpha subunit is uh, re reported to co-localize with growth hormone in pituitary cells. So these findings uh, have led to the suggestion that the expression of PIT1 in cells of the alpha SU-based gonadotropin cell lineage might uh, also lead to the expression of growth hormones, so a complex interaction of all these molecules in the cell-specific gene expression of the growth hormone gene. These findings have led to the, in this study, they transfected HP75 cells, so we're beginning to develop this other idea of all these different uh, cell lineages, um, and we will at some point talk about the method of producing uh, transiently transfected cell lines and immortalized transfected cell lines, which is probably the, the case uh, uh, here, to produce an immortal cell line uh, and uh, then transfect it with uh, other uh, genes to look at uh, interactions of gene products. <clears throat> so they were derived from a human non-functioning pituitary adenoma that expresses the alpha subunit and LH beta. So they transfected with PIT1 by using uh, an adenovirus flag PIT1 construct. Uh, so they, since they use the adenovirus, they're probably trying to form uh, an immortal or permanent uh, transfection of the cells, gives you a much more stable expression. You can study it for a much longer period of time. Most of the transfected cells uh, expressed growth hormone messenger RNA with fewer cells expressing prolactin and TSH beta messenger RNA. The HP75 cells express the genes for estrogen receptor and GATA2, thus allowing their expression of the GH, prolactin, and TSH beta messenger RNA uh, in response to PIT1. These results support the hypothesis that growth hormone can be induced in cells that possess an active alpha subunit gene and shed light on the uh, the basic molecular mechanism that drives the development of growth hormone, prolactin, and TSH beta expression in alpha subunit-based gonadotroph lineage. <clears throat> so you see that they're not overextending their interpretation of their data, but certainly uh, revealing a great deal of insight into the interplay of all these molecules uh, for cell and tissue-specific uh, gene expression. 
<clears throat> Next, then, I want to focus a bit on the estrogen receptor as we begin uh, to expand our understanding of estrogen receptor complexities. Again, because there's uh, especially breast cancer, but there are several estrogen-dependent uh, tumors, uh, cancers in humans. There's a lot of research on the estrogen receptor, uh, and as well for uh, reproductive control methods. Uh, but mostly it's uh, driven by cancers, of course. So this is from Journal of Endocrinology in 2005. Uh, gonadotrope estrogen receptor alpha and beta. So these are the two major uh, isoforms of the estrogen receptor. And progesterone receptor immunoreactivity. So we're suspecting that they're not looking at biological activity, just protein levels uh, through immunodetection. After overreactomy and exposure to estradiol benzoate, uh, tamoxifen or uh, raloxifene in the rat, and the correlation with LH secretion. So in this study, they're looking at the effects, in part, they're looking at the effects of the uh, estrogens, uh, synthetic estrogen analogs uh, that we know are uh, anti-cancer agents. You should recognize tamoxifen as a common uh, chemotherapeutic agent uh, to fight breast cancer. Uh, <clears throat> so they're questioning uh, the the role of these in the regulation of the uh, genes, uh, gene expression for the estrogen receptors, both the alpha, beta, and the progesterone receptor. <clears throat> they're not looking at messenger RNA, just at the protein gene product. So the selective estrogen receptor modulator uh, CIRM, uh, tamoxifen, uh, has agonist-antagonist actions on LH secretion in the rat, whereas in the absence of estrogen, it elicits progesterone receptor-dependent GNRH self-priming. Hmm. We'll talk about that later. <coughs> uh, uh, it uh, antagonizes estrogen stimulatory action on uh, LH secretion. So the aim of these experiments was to explore whether uh, TX treatment induced differential expression of the estrogen receptor alpha and beta in the gonadotrope uh, may determine its uh, agonist effect on LH uh, secretion. Uh, in the first experiment, basal LH secretion, GNRH stimulated LH secretion, and uh, progesterone dependent GNRH self priming uh, were uh, determined in incubated pituitaries uh, from overreactomized rats uh, treated with estradiol benzoate, uh, TX or RX. Uh, the um, cycling rats, lost my spot here, sorry. The cycling rats uh, in the metastrous or proestrous were used as basic controls as proestrous pituitaries from OVEX rats treated with uh, estradiol benzoate exhibited GNRH stimulated LH uh, secretion, immunohistochemical progesterone uh, receptor expression, and GNRH uh, self-priming. So there's a lot of concepts in that one sentence, and by the end of the semester, uh, you hopefully will be able to understand all of them. <clears throat> we won't try to dig into them much here. Let's just see what the authors uh, conclude. While RX had no effect on these parameters, TX induced the progesterone receptor expression and GNRH uh, self-priming, uh, the GNRH uh, Self-priming was absence in pituitaries incubated with anti-progesterone uh, ZK299. In the second experiment, we evaluated the immunohistochemical expression of the estrogen receptor alpha and beta in gonadotropes in cycling rats and overreactomized uh, rats treated with estradiol benzate, TX or RX. They found uh, that while ER alpha expression was similar in all six groups, ER beta uh, expression was uh, <clears throat> estrous cycle dependent. Moreover, ER alpha expression in gonadotropes and TX treated 
uh, rats was as high as those found in proestrus, while ER alpha expression in gonadotropes and RX treated rats was lower than in metestrus or proestrus pituitaries. These results suggest that in the absence of the cognate ligand, uh, TX, unlike RX, may regulate LH secretion through the ER alpha subtype in gonadotropes. So I know that that is a packed uh, abstract. And uh, obviously, at this point, uh, you would be very hard put to try to understand all of the significance of this. Again, I want you to appreciate what you will be better at, much more proficient at, by the end of the semester. We will study the estrus cycle in great detail. We'll understand the different phases of the estrus cycle and the significance of the levels of estrogen, what's going on at the pituitary. What is this priming thing that is going on? What are we priming for? <clears throat> but also we are seeing that the expression of the estrogen receptor is dependent upon estrogen uh, levels. Uh, and it is, of course, one of the receptors that we had mentioned before that if in receptor regulation, that if estrogen levels are virtually gone in an overectomized animal without some type of estrogen priming, uh, then the estrogen receptor levels will be very low. So these authors may have used that to get very nice results where you'd have very low estrogen receptor levels in the overectomized animal, then you get a dramatic change. Uh, but you certainly wouldn't be able to measure an additional decrease. So um, <clears throat> that might be why they use the <clears throat> excuse me, the cycling rats uh, in this study so that there would be some baseline level or dynamically uh, sustained level of the uh, estrogen receptor gene expression. <clears throat> and then here in 2001 in neuroendocrinology, uh, the uh, differential neonatal imprinting and regulation uh, of estrogen receptor subtypes alpha and beta, and of the truncated estrogen receptor product TERP1 mRNA expression in the male rat pituitary. So here we see that the estrogen receptor uh, is, gene is expressed in the male uh, anterior pituitary. This might not answer the question that we were looking at before, but it makes another point uh, about truncated estrogen receptor uh, product uh, messenger RNA. So if it's at the level of the messenger RNA, we ask ourselves is uh, how do we get this messenger RNA for a truncated uh, estrogen receptor? Is it through uh, a new gene, a separate gene, or is it through uh, alternative gene splicing from one of the others? So let's skim through this and see what we find. So there's two distinct nuclear estrogen receptors that have been identified. Uh, the classical one, renamed ER-alpha, this is the one we think of most frequently, and the more recently cloned ER-beta. In a variety of tissues, gene expression of both receptor types, subtypes results in the generation of multiple transcripts encoding the full length as well as several alternatively spliced isoforms. In the rat pituitary, a truncated tissue-specific variant ER-alpha, called TERP1, as we saw in the title, has been identified and found able to modulate ER alpha and ER beta activity. So it's not so simple uh, anymore, is it? <laughs> so far, its pattern of expression and hormonal regulation have been mostly studied in females. The present study was designed to analyze the pattern of expression of TERP1 mRNA in the male rat pituitary at different stages of postnatal development and to develop the impact of neonatal imprinting and estrogen treatment upon TERP1 expression in the male pituitary. So I'm not going to go continue through uh, the data. The points that I wanted to make from this are already made in the first half of this uh, uh, abstract. There are two different estrogen receptors, the one we think of most commonly, ER-alpha, and another one, ER-beta. And uh, we ask, are they uh, separate genes or two uh, mRNAs and protein product isoforms uh, produced through alternative splicing. We know that alternative splicing does occur and at least produces a truncated estrogen receptor protein and it may uh, interact with the others 
uh, to contribute to the uh, effects of estrogen at the anterior pituitary, at least. So the conclusion is the regulation of the TERP1 expression by neonatal or acute estrogen treatment uh, may thus represent an additional uh, tuning mechanism for estrogen actions in the male rat pituitary. <clears throat> so we now see that there are gender differences in the expression of aromatase in the anterior pituitary between males and females in mammals as well such that in males the aromatase uh, enzyme is present, testosterone is converted to estrogen, and the estrogen receptor is present in both male and female anterior pituitary cells and plays a functional role in the negative feedback of estrogen uh, in the anterior pituitary. I'm going to stop here uh, with lecture uh, chapter 9-2 and then pick it up with 9-3 to talk about adrenal steroid hormone target cell.